Konnichiwa, Minasan. Okay. Uh, are you mostly statisticians? No. no. You're not statisticians. I know. <laughs> but you're, the rest of you, what, what, are, what, are, what, are, what kind of disciplinary background do you have? Sorry? Biostatistics. Your biostatistics. Hands up, biostatisticians. Okay, only. T oh, oh, no. Okay, three, four. Biostatisticians are very shy, you know. <laughs> Hands up, biostatisticians. <laughs> There's no need to be ashamed of being a biostatistician. Um, you can be proud. Um, so, biostatisticians and people, um, and, and people with a psychiatry background, is that right? No? The others? Just public health. Okay. Nobody's going to say. All right. Okay. So uh, maybe put the lights off at the front. So um, about 20 years ago, I got involved with an organization called the Cochrane Collaboration. Has, has ever, anybody heard of the Cochrane Collaboration? Yeah? It's sort of... The, the, the idea was that if we could find all of the evidence from randomized trials and, you know, um, add it all together, then, you know, we, we'd get to, that would be the best evidence we could find, you know? And I, and I sort of, um, I really sort of, I don't know, I, I really fell in love with this idea, right? I sort of... I thought, oh, that's a great idea. You know, that's really good. Of course, if we could find all of the evidence from randomized trials. So randomized trials give the best evidence for the effectiveness of an intervention because of randomization. And if we could find all of the randomized trials, then we could reduce the, 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 the effect of random error. And that would be the best evidence we could, we could get. And I really l fell in love with this idea. You know, and, uh, you know, how many people have fallen in love here? Put your hand up. Oh, thank you, Sato. Wow, people are so shy. <laughs> well, you know what it's like. When you fall in love, you just think everything about the person that you fall in love with is really fantastic. You know, you just think, oh, they, they have the same taste in food and they like the same music as me. And isn't it fantastic? You know, we were absolutely meant to be together. Yeah? And I felt that way about the Cochrane Collaboration. And I've been married for about 20 years to the Cochrane Collaboration. And now I've fallen out of love. Right? And when you fall out of love, it's really terrible. <laughs> right? <laughs> because... You, you know, I mean, like when you fall out in love with a person, you know, to start with you think they're fantastic, and then later you think all of the things about them get on your nerves, you know? Like, why do they leave the toothpaste like that, you know? Why do they leave their socks on the floor? You know, that sort of thing. So it's like that with me and the Cochrane Collaboration right now. I feel like I've been married for 20 years, and now I've fallen out of love, and we're not divorced. I'm still a part of the Cochrane Collaboration. <laughs> so it hasn't got to divorce stage yet, but it, but, but it might do. Um, and I have lots of experiences, and experiences like this, right. So this was a press release from the Cochrane Collaboration, right. So it, it was um, a press release, and it said, pre-operative statin therapy reduces the odds of post-operative atrial fibrillation and shorten the patient's stay on ICU. I looked at that and I said, oh, that can't, that's just not true. That cannot be true. Why should it be true? It doesn't make any sense. So se 17 trials with, with 2,000 patients, and look, it halves the risk of atrial fibrillation. Now, now statins are a drug that reduce your cholesterol, right? They reduce the cholesterol, your cholesterol in your blood. They're not an antiarrhythmic drug. They don't have an, why should they have an effect on heart rhythms? Why should your cholesterol affect your risk of atrial fibrillation? 
So it just didn't seem right. I said, oh, that's wrong. So when, you know, when I saw that, I thought, I'm sure that's wrong. And then a year later, a large randomized controlled trial with more patients than all of the patients in the review altogether showed they had no effect on, on atrial fibrillation. And, you know, and, and this is all, this is the, this is the Cochrane review here, and that's the treatment effect. So these are the trials, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 small trials. When you add them up, you get a very huge reduction in the risk of atrial fibrillation. You know, it's like um, more than half reduction in the risk of atrial fibrillation. But the big trial, um, you know, w with, uh, you know, 2,000 patients shows no effect at all. And this happens all of the time uh, with Cochrane systematic reviews. You know, the, the, um, you know these, these are small trials. Look, they're 20 patients in each group, uh, you know, 100 patients in each group, small numbers of events. I've seen this so many times, Cochrane reviews get it wrong. Um, And then, so I said, to the, I said to the Cochrane Collaboration, look, probably either some of these trials are fraudulent or there's very extreme selection bias. But probably some of these trials are fraudulent. They're not randomized trials. So I asked them to look to see if they were fraudulent and they never told me whether they were or they were not but they withdrew the systematic review. You know, they just said, right, okay, we'll withdraw the systematic review. And now all you can find out is this re review has been withdrawn. Now really, you know, if you get something really wrong, you should want to know why you got it wrong. Yeah? Making mistakes is, making mistakes is the greatest opportunity, really. Because you've got, right, you've made a big mistake. You said they dramatically reduced the risk of post-operative atrial fibrillation. And they didn't. Let's understand why we made this mistake. And I, and I thought, great Cochrane collaboration. Let's see if we can understand why we made this mistake. But they didn't seem to want to know. They just withdrew the review. You know, business as usual. Let's carry on. And I was really disappointed about that. And that's one of the reasons I started to fall out of love with them. Um, but we see this. I mean, this has been well documented in the, med in the medical literature. And it's basically that small trials greatly overestimate the effects of treatments. And so this is um, a study where um, you compare the results... So the, 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 the outcome measure is the ratio of, resu of the results, you know, the risk ratio in the small trials versus the risk ratio in the big trials. And um, small trials, you know, with less than 50 patients, compared to larger trials with more than 1,000 patients, they just get much bigger treatment effects. So small trials always greatly overestimate the treatment effects. If, if, if you look across meta-analyses. So, meta-analyses of small trials are really unreliable. You mean a small trial or a small, small and published trial? Yes. Yeah, small and published trials. So these are the, all of the trials they could get hold of. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, the small trials that they could identify. Um, maybe if you could find all of the small trials, uh, maybe there wouldn't be a selection bias. Uh, uh, maybe there wouldn't be such steep uh, effects. But well, yeah, no, that that's that's a good point. In the, in this one, it was less than fifty patients. Really, it should be the size of a trial. Really, the the, the most important thing is the number of outcome events but it's kind of proportional to the number of patients usually because the event rates are you know, within a range. So this is a s less than 50 patients compared to 1,000 patients. So if I have 100, it can becomes more large? S 
you're absolutely right. Scientifically speaking, these terms have no meaning, small and large. They only have meaning compared to each other. Yeah? So this is less than 50 compared to 1,000. Yeah? And so trials with less than 50 patients compared to 1,000 have much bigger treatment effects. But I think that's a very good point. Because small and large, in fact, I don't think 1,000 is necessarily very large. You know, it depends. 1,000 um, could be small, it could be large, depending on the event rate. Um, so why do meta-analyses of small trials often get the wrong answer? Uh, I, I, think, I think the most likely reason is selection bias and the inclusion of fraudulent randomized trials. So that I think that single center trials, trials that are done in a single hospital, are more likely to be fraudulent than, than multi-center randomized trials. And I, I believe that because single center trials are very private in a way. Everything's very private. You, you usually have one investigator and, you know, in one hospital and then they report what they've done and you have to take their word that what they say they did, they actually did. Big trials are very public. So, like, um, you know, the trials that I've been, that we've, I've talked about, like the CRASH-3 trial. Now, I think we had something like 300 centers, 300 hospitals. So that's 300 centers um, doing the same thing. Everybody sees the protocol. If I wrote something in the manuscript that wasn't true, there'd be 300 people phoning me up and say, we didn't do that. You know, I, I, we, we, we never did that. You know, that, that wasn't the outcome. And so in big trials, you know, the protocol is published, the statistical analysis plan is published, the data is published. You know, so after we finish our trials, we put our data on a data sharing website. In fact, if you want the data, you can have the data. And you can check if, what our, if, if the way we analyzed the results was as we said in the analysis plan. So it's all very public. There's lots of witnesses. But when you do small trials, it's very private and nobody knows. So I think selection bias and include, inclusion of fraudulent randomized trials. Um, and so with selection bias, it's well known that so-called, you know, we have to put this in, in inverted commas, uh, Statistically significant results, that means the p-value is less than 0.05, uh, are more likely to be published, more likely to be published quickly, more likely to be published in English, more likely to be published more than once, and more likely to be cited. So, you know, these trials where the p-value is less than 0.05, because this, these are the trials that people think are positive trials, uh, right, so we talked about we talked last week about earlier in the week about you know there's no such thing as positive and negative and this dichotomization is silly but people believe it and you know they're they're much more likely to there was a very nice study about what German doctors do when they do a randomized trial so a German doctor does a randomized trial if the p value is less than 0.05 they'll think great. I can publish this in an English language journal because this is a significant result. And if the p-value is less than, is more than 0.05, they think, ah, oh, I'll have to publish this in the German journal, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's the same in Japan. If you get a highly statistically significant result, if you think, great, New England Medical Journal, JAMA, you know? And if you, get it, if you get a not significant result, it's the, you know, Nihon Shinrigaku journal. <laughs> I don't know, I can't think of a journal in, in, um, in, in Japanese. But maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that, that happens. And then, um, you know, 
there's selective reporting of outcomes as well in systematic reviews. So some really, these are good studies. So, you know, uh, cohort studies, you know, 32% of outcomes in the publication were not in the protocol. 41% of outcomes in the protocol were not in the publication. So you can have selection bias at the level of the whole trial, and you can have selection bias at the level of outcomes within the trial. So if you, if, if it, if you collect 100 outcomes, the out, you know, in the protocol, there's 100 outcomes, you collect 100 data on 100 outcomes from the patient, but the ones that appear in the paper are selected. So, and um, Professor Furukawa did a nice study, I thought, which was showing that um, the amount of um, Furukawa sensei, you can say what you found, can you? <laughs> I'm not going to say what you found in, when you're in the room. Yeah. Mm. And the uh, more, uh, the greater number uh, of studies contributed to the primary outcome, the best studies became smaller. Yes. So strongly suggesting selective publication of out by you know at the level of outcomes, and um, and there's been other studies that show you know harms are greatly unreported. So if you get a significant, um, if you get a harm, it's it's it. It's two thirds of trials won't report it, so that's really important. You know, the selection bias on about harms seems to be really severe. So that's selection bias. Selection bias is a really big problem, and then also I I've realised that fraud is a very big problem too, and um, I told you that I've always been very interested in head injury, and so. One of the treatments for head injury is this treatment called mannitol, right? It, it's, um, so basically, after you've had a head injury, your brain starts to expand inside your skull. And um, if the pressure gets too high, that kills the patient. So they give sh sugar solution into the veins, and it pulls water out of the brain by osmosis. And I, th and I thought, well, let's do a systematic review of, these tr of, of this treatment to see if it really works. And I published a review in the Cochrane Library. I was the, I was the first author. And this is what I concluded. In the preoperative management of patients with acute intracranial hemorrhage, high-dose mannitol reduces mortality, right? Like by a half, you know? Now, now I think how stupid I was, but, you know, a, a quite a reasonably precise and reduced disability by a half, right? Wow, that's a really effective treatment, you know? Head injury, you've got a patient with head injury and you give them this treatment, they're half as likely to die and half as likely to be disabled. Wow, that's great. So I published this and I was very happy about it and then, uh, and then we were doing the CRASH-2 trial and I was at a meeting in, in, in South America and I met my friend Jorge Mejia, who was the Colombian national coordinator, and he said, oh, Ian, he was just, you know, just after the meeting, he said, Ian, you do know that all of the trials included in your meta-analyses were fabricated. <laughs> so I said, Jorge, of course I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, of course I didn't know they were all fabricated. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Julio Cruz, uh, we all knew him. He never did any research. Wow. So I had to go back. So Julio Cruz published all of the trials. So there were three reasonably sized trials for, for neurosurgery. Um, Julio Cruz published them all. And they were published in quite leading journals in head injury. So I thought, right, OK, I better investigate this. So I said, let's, let's find Julio Cruz. Now, he, uh, um, the address for correspondence at the bottom was the Comprehensive Center for Neuroemergencies, Sao Paulo. So, I don't know what you imagine when I say 
comprehensive center for neuroemergency Sao Paulo, I imagined a building, yeah? I imagined a building with maybe a door that you walk into and perhaps a receptionist, uh, you know, to, to greet you. And then you say, I'm looking for Professor Cruz. And he said, oh, he's on the 10th floor or something like that. that that's what I expected. It didn't exist. There was no such, no tatemono. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing, there was no building at all, right? It was just a P.O. box. You know these little things with the key and you open it and you get your mail? It was, it was, there was no building at all. I, I wrote to the university and I said, um, I said, he, he was employed, he was a professor at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. So I wrote to the Federal University of Sao Paulo. I said, can you help me get in touch with Professor Cruz? He said, we don't have a Professor Cruz. So he's not a professor at our university. So all randomized trials in Brazil have to be approved by the Brazilian National Committee on Research Ethics. So I said, them, can you tell me, can you show me the ethics approvals for these trials? Those trials, we, we never approved those trials. So there was no... Um, no evidence, that the, no, no evidence of ethics committee approval. But the, the trials, you see, they had co-authors. So I, I found it very difficult to contact Cruz, but he worked with two co-authors, Minoja, who, who was a doctor in, in, in Italy, and Okuchi, who was a doctor in Japan. So I thought, right, let's, let's find Minoja and Okuchi. And I, I, I managed to find them, and I wrote to them, and they wrote back. And... Um, I'll read you the Japanese one, because it, it, it's the most interesting, I think. Since I did not conduct any study related to the results of Dr. Cruz's high-dose mannitol trials in Japan, I have no data to present you. So it wasn't a multi-center. It wasn't like Brazil, Italy, uh, Brazil, Italy Japan. Um, I did not know any part of the paper before he called me about acceptance in the journal. Wow. That's interesting. So there's this man somewhere sitting in Japan who gets a call from Dr. Cruz and he says, good news, you've published a paper. <laughs> and, you know, and, Dr. and Mr. Okuchi says, uh, great, what was it about? <laughs> you know? So he didn't know anything about the paper and, and his colleagues it, it, and the other guys, the other co-authors, in, in Italy, said exactly the same thing, you know, um, or, you know, uh, I, I basically helped him talk about the discussion, you know, but I don't know anything about the data. So basically, Dr. Cruz wrote these papers, sent them to these people he must have known in different parts of the world, and invited them to be co-authors, and they were, or, I don't know if he did invite them to be co-authors, he just put them as co-authors and then told them that they were co-authors. Uh, but they knew, they knew nothing about it. So, he's not a professor, there's no building, there's no ethics, research ethics committee approval. His co-authors don't know anything about the studies. So I wrote to the editor of the journal and I said, right, okay. And I tried to contact the editor and I missed him and then I was trying to contact him by phone I'm, he missed me, I missed him, and eventually he wrote to me in email. He said, um, as you can see, we all doubted the data, but to doubt is different from concluding he fabricated the data. I thought he did, right? So this is the editor of the journal who published his results. He thought the data were fabricated. Oh, well, that's very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, but hoped that publication would encourage repetition. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? So the editor of the journal receives your manuscript. He says, well, this is, this is a fake. Let's publish it. You know, I find that really, really surprising. And he wrote to me about this, and, and he was happy to put this in paper. So... I found out later that Cruz committed suicide, right? He committed suicide in 2005. That was two years after we published this um, meta-analysis. Uh, his co-authors 
declined to retract the papers, right? So these papers, if you search PubMed, they're still there, right? They're still there looking like regular publications. Uh, but I, I, the, my friend Jorge Mejia was correct, they never happened. I'm almost certainly convinced they never happened. And then I tried to tell, I, try, I wrote to the editors of the journals who published the papers and asked them to retract them, and they declined as well. Right? So there is this evidence in the literature that everybody, you know, we, we know we can't trust, and they, nobody wants to pull it out. And they don't want to pull it out because it's a risk to them, you know? They just think it's a risk. It might, the fact that they published it looks embarrassing, um, that if we, if we try to retract it, um, somebody might complain. I, 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 was, I was really surprised. So that was the first time that I'd um, published fraudulent studies. And then it happened again. So this time, there's, um, I was very interested in fluid resuscitation. So you can give different fluids when patients are bleeding. You can give starch or you could give um, albumin or different, different kinds of fluids you can, you can give. And I wanted to know which was the best. So we did a meta-analysis to compare and it looked like, um, it looked like um, which is this, starch is albumin, death. Um, starch was slightly better. So there was these one, two, three, four, five trials by this author Bolt, a German author called Bolt. And um, he always, he did lots and lots of randomized trials. They always showed starch was um, slightly better. Uh, hang on, this is, a re is it relative outcome death? And this shows that starch is slightly worse, doesn't it? Anyway. But, um, okay, no, slightly more, slightly more deaths in, in, the, uh, in the album, slightly fewer deaths in the albumin-treated group. And um, then it turned out that he'd been f fabricating these trials. So what happened is he, the journal Anesthesia and Analgesia published a study by him. Um, the editor gets peer review comments and says, you know, you know these, these results are really incredible. I can't believe them. So the hospital makes an investigation and finds out that he's published 90 randomized trials that he didn't do. So 90 randomized trials. He didn't do any research. He didn't do randomized trials, but he sat in his office writing randomized trials and he published them all. And they went through peer review and journals, you know, and, and everything was published. And they never happened. Um, so when we, dis when we discovered that 90 randomized trials by this guy were fraudulent, the British, the British guidelines on resuscitation had to be changed because it, it depended on his results, you know. So patients were being treated according to his advice, the results of his trials. And then, then they didn't happen. And, and, then, um, you know, and then when we published, JAMA published a meta-analysis like the one we published in the Cochrane Library that excluded his trials and it got a different result. It didn't look that this treatment was safe and effective at all. It looked like this treatment was potentially harmful. So this is, this is twice now. That, you know, so this Cochrane collaboration that I, uh, I was really in love with, and I'm finding, wow, look, this is not good. You know, this is, this is very bad. And then I got very suspicious about everything. And so we'd, we'd, I'd published, um, I was interested in tranexamic acid in postpartum hemorrhage. And we were planning a trial. Before we planned the trial, we reviewed the evidence from previous trials. And I thought, well, maybe... Maybe some of these trials were fabricated too. Maybe, maybe I'm not being suspicious enough in the past. Let's go back and do it again. So we went back and do it, did it again. And my colleague, Catherine Kerr, noticed something very interesting. This, this was one of the early trials in 2004 by um, 
a Chinese author, I think, called Guy. I think it was Chinese. And they made a mistake in the, in the, in the title of the publication. It's a, a prospective, randomized, case-controlled clinical trial. Right? Now, that's a mistake. There are randomized, controlled trials, and there are case-controlled studies, but there are not randomized, case-controlled studies. Right? That's a mistake. Could be, you know, it's an easy mistake to make. But the, in, the interesting thing was that she noticed that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven subsequent trials from different authors in different parts of the world, India, Turkey, Iran, different parts of the world, they made the same mistake. The same mistake in the title of the paper. Ah. Oh. What's going on there? You know, that's strange. So we thought, that's a bit suspicious. So we put all of these papers, you know, we, we got all of these papers, we printed them out, we put them on the floor, and we were going around on our hands and knees, you know, looking at these papers. And they had all the same words. You know, all the words are the same. You know, this is about um, tranexamic acid in caesarean section. Caesarean section rates have increased. They're, they're, they're all of, lots and lots. Of, there were a few words that were different, but most of the words were the same. And then we, these are the trials where they have the same words, and most of the results were all the same as well. So these trials, different authors in different places, I just they didn't they they didn't happen. They just saw a trial, one of the early trials, and thought, oh, we can do that. We can copy that one. And so they copied them. So an author from Iran sees this paper from Guy and says, oh, we could have done that maybe in my hospital. So let's copy that, right? Send it for publication. It's published. Great. You know, very good. You know, line on the CV. <laughs> you know, contribution to science. Great. Um, now that's, that's like, in all of the trials, that's about a third of the trials. So like, you know, so it happened to be once, it happened to be again, then I was very skeptical, and then I find a third of the trials <coughs> are, are probably fabricated. And you can do other things, like um, one of the interesting things you can do if you suspect that the studies included in your meta-analysis are not really randomized trials, is you can do a, a meta-analysis of the baseline variables, right? So you know how a randomized trial works. You, you randomly allocate patients to one group or the other. And if, if you've really randomly allocated them, on average, the two groups will be the same apart from the treatment on baseline characteristics. You shouldn't expect, you know, big differences in baseline characteristics. But when we did a meta-analysis of the baseline hemoglobin in all of these trials, it was much lower in one group than the other. You know, that, that shouldn't really happen. Um, you know, you shouldn't get a, you know, you, you could get it by chance. It could be a bad luck chance, but you shouldn't really get it. So, if you believe the trials, but once you start not believing the trials, then this starts to be information. So, you know, statistically significant differences, or, you know, the P less than P.01 difference, you know, they're probably not randomized. So I started talking to the Cochrane Collaboration about this. I said, look, a lot of these studies we're including in, in meta-analysis, these meta-analysis, they're just not real. And so what, what's your policy on fraud? And they said, well, we, we don't really have one, you know. They're a very kind of trusting organization. They say, it, it's a very sort of, they're, they're very sort of trusting and very sort of internationalist, right? They say, right, it's, it's got an ethic, this organization. And it goes like this. It says, everybody, everyone, anywhere in the world who's done a randomized trial, you're welcome, you know. We will gather you in, however big or however small your trial, we want to know about it. And when I was first involved with the Cochrane Collaboration, I used to search journals by hand 
looking for trials that they hadn't in included in their registers. You know, I used to search the Croatian Journal of Surgery and find out, oh, there's a randomized trial, tell the Cochrane Collaboration about it, put it on the Cochrane um, register of trials. But now I'm, I feel, ah, oh, I was so naive, you know. I, I was so naive to think that this is a, a good... So they have no policy on fraud, which means they ignore it, right? They just take everything on trust. They trust everybody. Um, and then they say, well, we use rigorous... We use grade to assess the quality of the evidence. Now, you can assess the quality of, a, of the, you can take the manuscript and you can assess the quality of the evidence, but, you, but you're only assessing quality if any, everything that's written down in that manuscript is true, you know, and we take that on trust. So I, I, I sort of stopped believing, you know, I said, well, you just trust everybody, you know, um, and, and I didn't believe it, and so I, we published something in the, in the British Medical Journal. We, we said you know, the knowledge system that healthcare is based on is just not fit. It, it doesn't work, you know. People saying these systematic reviews provide the best evidence and that's what we should base our healthcare on. You know, systematic reviews of randomized trials, those are the best evidence. That's what should guide treatment decisions. Doctors need to look at systematic reviews and then treat the patient. I just, I just didn't believe it. So you could see, you could see now the process of not of falling out of love with the Cochrane collaboration. So, um, and of course, the Cochrane collaboration really didn't like this at all. You know, the editor in chief wrote a letter complaining about me and this and that and the other. So our little part of the Cochrane collaboration said, because I'm I'm the editor of the Cochrane Injuries Group, and I said, right. I don't care if the Cochrane collaboration as a whole is not going to change. We're going to change what we do. And we're going to do two things. We're only going to include prospectively registered trials. Right? We're only going to include prospectively registered trials. And when we, and when we include those trials, we're going to check that the data are real. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do that. And so, you know, what we, what we je often do is we ask to say, can you send me evidence of ethics committee approval and can you send me the data set so that we can check it? Um, that, that's very interesting. When you ask for the data, when you ask for the data from these randomized trials, you realize that the world is a very dangerous place because you get letters back and they said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't send you the data. It was in my hospital and it burnt down. I'm sorry I can't send you the data, it was in my basement and there was a flood, you know. I'm sorry I can't send you the data, it was in the computer in the back seat of my car when I crashed. And you thought, wow, it's a really dangerous world. <laughs> you know, something's really happening out there, you know. And then you think, mm, do I believe this? <laughs> But, you know, there were floods and thefts and fires and, you know, and like ants, ants at the man, ants, you know, termites at the data. Very, very suspicious. So, um, so we decided, like, we decided, look, this big idea of the Cochrane collaboration to include all trials, you can't check everything because it takes too much time. So we decided that the best thing to do would be to throw away the small trials, right? Throw away the small trials because they're not worth the time, right? You've got a, you've got a randomized trial with 50 patients, 25 in the treatment group, 25 in the control group. It's just not information. So just throw it away, right? Um, and so, and focus, focus your efforts on the big trials. And if there are any big trials, then you just say, we don't know. So focus efforts on the big trials. So now in, in the meta-analysis I do, it, we, 
with, uh, with my team, we say, right, we will include, we write it in the protocol, we will include trials with more than a thousand patients. And that saves you a lot of time because you don't have to deal with all of the small, small rubbish. That, a lot of it isn't true. And actually, the time you have to spend finding out if it is true isn't worth it. You know, you, you could spend, a, you spend as much time checking the data for a big trial as a small trial, but the small trial gives you very little information. So it's, it's not worth the time. And then we focus on prospectively registered trials. Now, everybody knows that trials need to be prospectively registered. But why do we re reg prospectively register them? What do you think? Why do we register randomized trials before we, ran we enroll the first patient? It is a policy, and, and, the ed and the journal editors insist that it was registered. They won't publish the trial unless it was registered. But, but why do we do this? Because of the, the providing the evidence. So that they have an evidence. When the editor asks for any kind of evidence, they can have that register and present it. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you need to have evidence that it's prospectively registered. But what's the advantage? What, what, what do we gain from registering trials? Integrity. Integrity. Yep. To feed the enrollment situation. Therefore, so I think uh, it's necessary to register the, all the information of the clinical trial prior to enrollment. Yes, I, 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 think, I, I think that's right. So, if you, the idea is that if you, when you start a trial, you don't know what the results are going to turn out to be, right? And so, if at the start of a trial, before you know what the results are, you say what outcome data you're going to collect and um, <coughs> then it's clear that you collected these outcomes and if you only publish some of those outcomes that we'll know that you, only, you didn't publish them all. Yeah? So, f first of all, it gives you a cohort of prospectively registered trials so that you can look back and say, right, say you have 100 trials registered and you have 50 trials in the literature. You can look back and say, well, where are the results of the 50 trials that, I, that weren't published? Yeah? So it allows you to have an inception cohort, a cohort, right? All right, there, there are 100 trials in the start. And then some trials never get started, some trials start, uh, they don't recruit as well as possible. They, they, you know, some trials get to the end, the, the authors look at the results, they think, well, that's not very interesting, we're not going to publish that. But if you know there were 100 trials to start with, you can go back and find them, right? So it gives you the possibility of finding the total population of trials before there was this selection from the results, by the results. I mean, it also does what you said. It stops data-dependent analyses because you should write the, the statistical analysis plan as well. Yeah? So, I mean, it was, it was first suggested by a guy called Symes in 1986. And he did a, a, a meta-analysis of published trials and he found that the treatment looked beneficial and, he f and then he did a meta-analysis of all the prospectively registered trials and got a different result. So he said, right, we should be doing 
we, you know, we should, if we want to include all of the evidence without this selection bias, we need prospective registration. And then we can see, well, look, how many trials started? Let's get the results from them all. Yeah, that's the idea. And it's like, it's like we don't do systematic reviews on the winners. This is what happens at the moment. You know, if winning is being published, we only do systematic reviews on the winners. Whereas we should be doing systematic reviews on the starters. Yeah? We should know who was at the start. These are, the, these are prospectively registered trials. These are at the start of the trial. And a trial is like a marathon. You might not get to the end, right? Only some get published and at the end. They're the winners, right? If you only look at winners, you don't get the truth. You've got to look at all of the, all of the evidence. And then you can do what the, 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 the gentleman at the back says. You can, you can compare what they said they would do with what they actually reported and see if there's any difference. So that's what we, we, said, we, that's what we said we'd, we'd only include prospectively registered trials and we'd check that the data are real and accurate. And um, again, Professor Furukawa's work, um, you know, lots of trials are not real. You know, lots of trials, um, you cannot, um, I mean, the recommendations from this study, reviews should verify the study design by contacting the authors and checking their protocols and source data. Yes, I completely agree with that. Exercise caution in, in using systematic reviews that uncritically incorporate trials identified in chi Chinese databases. Yeah, I, I think uncritical inclusion of trials, in this case in Chinese databases, but to be fair, this is the world leading fabricator of trials. I'm sorry to say he's Japanese. Yoshitaka Fuji. You know, Bolt fabricated 90 trials. Yoshitaka Fuji fabricated 183. He's the record holder in the world. And, um, you know, he, he, the interesting thing, you know, he, Tokyo Medical and Dental University, University of Tsukuba, Toho University, he was publishing eight randomized trials a year. Eight randomized trials a year. I publish one every eight, eight years. <laughs> But he was really publishing. I don't know how anybody could do that, right? And presumably, in his university, did they? Th how did the how did the university think he could publish eight randomized trials a year? I don't know. You know, didn't anybody think to check in the university? You know, Professor Fuji. Wow, another trial. You know, a month later, whoa, another one, here we go. You know, he's really publishing these trials very, very quickly. Didn't anybody know? I don't know. I, I, I don't think universities care whether what you publish is true or not, which is a remarkable thing to say, isn't it? You know, a university doesn't care. Well, maybe it does care, but it doesn't check. I've been working at my university doing trials for about 25 years and no, one's, no one from my university has ever checked my data. I could be cheating. So, right, so because I knew Professor Furukawa was here, I, 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 this is, this is a, a, a systematic review that he was involved in uh, with others from the University of Ox Oxford. So all randomized trials, as far as, I, as far as I could see, were included regardless of registration status. So um, it's, I think it's difficult to exclude selection bias. I, 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 th I believe, and I, I raised this so that we could have some discussion, that, you know, we can't, I don't think we can do this anymore. We have to find a, a cohort 
of prospectively registered trials, and then we have to seek all of those trials. And that actually just taking the published trials, or the ones we can uh, find, um, we, I'm not sure if we can do that anymore. And the interesting thing is that I think John Ioannidis is one of the authors of this. And he had written previously about psychiatry trials that, you know, he, he'd, he, he acknowledged publication bias is huge a problem. So publication bias is a huge problem. You know, while only half of these trials had significant effects, published reports almost always have significant effects. So one of the authors is very skeptical about psychiatry trials, published psychiatry trials. Very strong selection bias. Um, but I don't know why, why he changed his mind. <laughs> For seven percent. Ah, so. Ah, I'm glad I raised it then, because, so, you included all trials regardless of registration status, but, all of these trials had to be, submitted to the FDA. Oh, I see. For 70 percent. Oh, I hadn't realized that. Well, I'm glad I raised it then because I, I, I hadn't realized that. And are you satisfied that those Yeah, yeah. But we are, say, let's say, I don't know, 80% confident yeah. that this data set is free of publication bias. Ah, I so see. Are the trials possible? Because we have gone through this list, I don't know, 20 times with Andrea to ch check if there is no duplicate publication. And in the uh, older data sets, it is so difficult to know which trial comes from which other trial, or if the same data set may be reported by another indication. Ah, okay. And we noticed the very same thing you have been talking about in this data set, mm. like the exact publication of the data set. Yeah. And the duplicate publication of two trials combined into one. And then actually, after publishing that trial, we submitted, you know, we've been doing some secondary analysis, and one guy, one anonymous reviewer pointed out, this trial must be the same as the other trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should be as well as 210 trials. I see. So, so I think we're sort of finding out very similar things at the same yeah. time because. I can give you examples of whatever you just described today. Yeah. So it's almost like, I mean, they might be real trials, but their results kind of get magnified, don't they? Mm. So that we think we need 10 years before we know the true effects of, in this case, amyloid crisis. And we have found that out through uh, cumulative network meta analysis that the uh, initial effect sizes are almost always exaggerated. Yeah. And we need 10 hours. I mean, 10 years, not 10 hours. I wish it were 10 hours, but 10 years before we know the true efficacy of any agent. And by that time, we. Ah. So when you first start taking a, a, an antidepressant, you feel really good, but it wears off. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the, uh, uh, the, the results of... Ah, uh, you're talking about the results of trials. The ones that get published early are the ones who uh, have more likely to have... It's a time lag bias yes, thing. Yes, so, kind of. But then, as I say, we have no publication bias, and so that uh, the year, the year that we took was the year of the first study, rather 
I see. Okay, yeah. So you went, you did a lot more than most Cochrane reviews do. Yeah. A lot more. You, you went to the FDA records and, um, mm, and, the, and the drug companies. And the drug companies were forthcoming, they were helpful. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting um, because um, so my feeling about the whole Cochrane endeavour has changed completely, and I, I, I feel it's like this is this is what I feel Cochrane is is about at the moment. <laughs> it's just like there's all of this rubbish, and it's just going through this rubbish. And it picks out, you know, it gathers all of this rubbish together and, um, and, and kind of makes diamonds out of it. And I just don't believe that's possible. And I think what we should do is, like, I just think we've got to throw away many more trials that I just don't think they provide useful information. And this ethic that the Cochrane Collaboration has of every little trial matters is just not true. Every little trial doesn't matter. You should, small trials, you should just not bother. But, and then if you get a, a bigger trial, you should properly check it. Um, so th there we are. That's the story of a marriage and a divorce.